Good afternoon and welcome to this tutorial session entitled Code to Cloud in 45 Minutes. Slightly misnamed because this is actually a three and a half hour or close to three and a half hour session. Um, but I've got plenty to fill the three and a half hours. Um, and if you opt to just take the first 45 minutes, I'm sure you'll get a ton out of the, out of the session. So I'll give you a fair amount of background over the course of the next while on what we're doing and why we're doing it and also why I think it's highly important for kind of the future of software development. Um, and what we're going to do first off, just to get everybody up to speed, is I'll have everybody get started with the installation and setup of this platform as a service before I actually start defining what it is and why it's, why it's so um, powerful. So we'll uh, start with the installation and setup, and then we'll look at uh, an overview of what of basically the cloud and platform as a service is and what it can bring to a development organization. And then we'll look at some applications that you can deploy basically with a click of a button. And then we'll spend a fair amount of time deploying Python applications to a cloud, to the cloud as you'll see. As I say, I've got a couple of three hours to fill here. And uh, as time permits, I'm going to spend time on what I call cluster configuration, allowing us to build up a cluster of multiple cl uh, VMs that make up this, this cloud, this pass. And we'll look at scaling a little bit. I actually have a talk tomorrow. It's, it's, a, it's not a tutorial. It's a talk that will focus on scaling with uh, Python in the cloud. I'll cover a little bit of that here, but it'll, it'll be a lot more detail tomorrow. And we'll look a little bit about with uh, logs and how you can handle, manage logs in cloud-based apps. And also in uh, a little bit about monitoring them so you can get a, a feel for how they're performing and making sure everything is healthy. Before I dive into it, uh, just a little intro introduction about me and wh why I'm here. So my background, I should probably admit this immediately, um, two things I should admit. First of all, I was going to tag team this session with someone else from our company, and they are uh, unfortunately unable to attend this. So it was left to me. And uh, I will say I'm not an, uh, an expert Python programmer. Kind of an understatement. Um, however, I've got many, many years of enterprise software development experience in other languages, and also a fairly, uh, fairly involved exposure with the cloud recently and with platform as a service. And the content I'm going to provide to you applies to software developers of all breeds. And uh, there will be some Python specific things, but it's mostly about how you as a Python developer can rapidly accelerate your potential in your productivity using tools like platform as a service. The other thing I'll say is, uh, as I said, I was in enterprise development for decades now. And last summer, I um, came across this product called Staccato, which is a platform as a service product. And I just thought, oh, I'll try that out. This was in the midst of me working at a startup that was, was doing all sorts of interesting things. I downloaded Staccato. I got it running, and I deployed an app to it. And the second the app deployed, I was, it was like I was hit with a lightning bolt. I had to stand up out of my chair and pace around the room for a while just as the implications of it sunk in. And that was uh, six months ago. And since that moment, well, shortly thereafter, I discovered they had a job opening there for a developer evangelist. And I'm, I'm more, you know, I did an evangelism gig at Sun back in the 90s. Um, but since then, I've been just doing dev. And, uh, but this product just pulled me so hard, um, I thought, OK, I got I to gotta do it. And uh, so I did. I applied for the job and got it. And since that time, I've been kind of consumed with the power of platform as a service. And my whole goal is to try to kind of share that passion that I'm feeling. I really think that platform as a service is going to change the way we build software. Today's talk is not a product talk. I'm not going to pitch Staccato here, the uh, platform as a service we provide. I am going to pitch platform as a service in general. There's a lot of products out there. 
However, I am very comfortable and familiar with staccato, so I will be using that, as will you, for the examples. I truly believe that 2013, or maybe next year, 2014, will be the year of the paths for software development organizations and teams. I think there, it's like there's this wave forming thousands of miles offshore, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when it hits the shore, it's going to be a doozy, basically. It's, it's, and it's happening now already. And um, having uh, spent a fair amount of time building software for small and large companies, if I could have had platform as a service at four or five of these companies, it would have changed everything, just bottom to top. And I'm, I am personally convinced that it would change everything for most software endeavors today. So I really hope I can communicate that during the course of the next three hours and 20 minutes or whatever that I have. So before I dive into some of the background and specifics, I would like to get everybody, if possible, up to speed with getting a platform as a service either deployed on your personal system, or I can give you access to one that's on basically available in the cloud. So that will bring me to my next or kind of first question here. And I'll ask a few uh, over the next few minutes. Um, has, who in here has successfully been able to download the bits for Staccato? Um, OK, so that's th three or four of you. OK. So there's a couple of options here. I have the images on USB sticks. For the folks here that have a virtualization container installed on your system, um, I encourage you to grab one of these and, and basically load it into, let's say, VMware or VirtualBox. So who in this room would be in that category? And I'll start handing out sticks. So, so actually, what I'll do is I'm just going to, if you don't mind, and you can pass them around. And I, have to, I have a copy of it, too, if somebody wants to get a copy. Oh, great. And from my machine and onto their thumb drive. I have a thumb drive, too, if somebody wants to use that. Great, OK. So what you're going to do is, this is perfect, thank you, if you don't mind. I apologize, I should have had enough USB sticks for the whole room, but I don't. So I'll let these USB sticks circulate throughout the room. And what you will do, and what I can, even, I can show you as well on here, hopefully, if everything works out for me. So what you've got on that disk, on that stick, looks, it should look something like this. Um, I should also warn you that you'll, prob you'll need the client as well. So there's two sides to it. And you'll get all this once we start diving into it. Um, there's a directory on this USB stick called Staccato, which contains two images. One of them is for uh, VirtualBox, which is a free product from Sun, or Oracle, I should say. And uh, which you can download fairly quickly and run on Mac or Linux or Windows. And then if you do have VirtualBox, then you just load, you basically import this image into VirtualBox, and you'll be able to get it going. And then if you're using VMware, the VMware Fusion on the Mac, or just the VMware, uh, whatever it is on Windows, um, you can then import or load the, the, the VMware 2.8.2 image into VMware. So those are the, the two options. Now, I realize I'll probably um, there's several people here that don't have either VirtualBox and, and VMware and maybe aren't feeling inclined to load it. So in a few minutes, what I'll do is I'll set you up with a, a kind of a, a cloud-based platform as a service that you can do everything we're doing, pretty much everything we're doing today, you can do it on my instances in the cloud. Um, I just had those, I just set those up this morning. And uh, so... Um, but with that in mind, what I'm going to do is I will step through just what you will be doing to load Staccato into um, VMware. I'll use VMware as an example unless people... Actually, let me take a poll. Of the people that have containers, who's using VMware? So five, and who's using VirtualBox? Okay, looks like a majority is on VirtualBox. So I think I'll, I'll do the VirtualBox example. And uh, I'll just show you the steps involved. There, there's very little to do. There's like three steps. The biggest time-consuming thing is downloading the bits 
and then a little bit more to import them into VirtualBox. It takes a few, I don't know, 40 seconds or something. So let me show you how this works. So here, um, here's the contents of this USB stick. We're going to choose a VirtualBox. I'm just going to unzip this thing. So it's, gonna, it's got, a, I don't know, four or five files associated with it. I'll unzip it. Um, I do obviously recommend you copy it from the stick first before doing all this, or you'll be here for about a week. So having done that, there's several files available in here. One of them is an OVF file. It stands for Open Virtualization Format. It's one of the, there's various, there's dozens of these things. Uh, VirtualBox is comfortable with OVF. So the next thing I'm going to do is um, launch VirtualBox. I've got an old version, obviously. And the next thing I'll do here is go to the File menu and say Import Appliance. There's several ways I could do this. And then I say Open Appliance, and then I go find that image I just unzipped, which I thought I just put there. I guess it's, oh, excuse me. It's on. Oh, stick. Oh, I put it in staccato. Okay. Let's try that again. <laughs> staccato. Stick. Staccato. There it is. And in here, there's this. This is the directory that's created. And now, if I open this OVF file, it then basically allows me to, to import this thing. I hit continue. It shows me some of the settings for this. The one important thing I highly recommend you do, or I actually insist that you do, is reinitialize the MAC address of all the uh, network cards. If we don't do this, um, we're going to have issues because, let's say, four or five of you will have the same MAC address, and when you try to join the network, you'll be getting IP, you'll be getting conflicts, as the DHCP server will say, "Well, I've already given you an address, and here it is," and blah blah blah. So make sure you reinitialize the IP address or the MAC address for all network cards on this VM. Click import, and then um, it just imports the image for you. Is that only for VirtualBox? Yes. Uh, no. Sorry. That. On VMware, you need. To please. Do. Yes. Okay. Actually, I'll do VMware too while we're waiting. So, um, okay. back here. Um, back to stick. Staccato. Here's the uh, VMware image again. I'll just. I'm probably gonna trounce on everything else I'm doing, but I'm going to unzip this guy. I already have it in VMware, so is there a setting that I need to flip around? I'll show you that right away. So it is kind of an unfortunate thing with the VM images that are being handed out. They have a pre-configured MAC address generally, and, and uh, sometimes they don't get reset automatically, but it is nice if they could be. So I've just uh, expanded this VMware image, or just about. And that has given me a single file called, it's with the uh, extension um, .vmware vm. As you might expect, that will load nicely right into VMware. So here's VMware. Next thing I'll do is I'll make sure you hit the open command if you're using VMware. And then go over here to stick staccato and click that. And now it's going to open this thing. And to answer your question, this is where you would do this. Um, and we'll get to this in VirtualBox. I, I realize I'm doing both at the same time here. With, with VMware now, this is for the VMware folks. Uh, there's two things you need to do. In Network Adapter, you need to change the network. Let me just make sure this is going to work in here. It should work. To a uh, bridge network. That'll allow it to get on the network. And the next thing you need to do is click Advanced Options and again, regenerate or reset the MAC address. You can do that as many times as you want. And then you can boot this thing. Okay, I'm not going to boot it because I already have one booted. And uh, that is the uh, steps for VMware. Now for VirtualBox, let's go back there. I have imported this image. I haven't booted it yet. In here it's saying it's powered off, so it's ready to go. So I'll go to, go to settings here. Aha, USB. I knew that was going to happen. Um, the reason I've got this issue is because VMware grabbed my USB port. Um, and it actually doesn't matter so much. Um, I'm not going to use VirtualBox today, but you shouldn't have this issue. And if you do, let me know and I'll set you up with something else. But in VirtualBox, go to Network and change it to Bridge ad Bridged Adapter. And again, go to Advanced and um, you, you can reset the MAC address, although I think we already did it. You can do it as many times as you want. 
and then click OK, and then you'll be able to boot this guy. I'm not going to do it because uh, I'll probably run out of memory if I try to do them all at once. So that was the virtual box. Well, by the way, once you've got past these two steps I just gave you, it's identical. It doesn't matter whether you're on VirtualBox, VMware, or you're in, on Amazon, AWS, or you're in you know, Heroku. It doesn't matter. Wherever you are, it's the same. And I'll show you how that works shortly. So um, having done that, I'm going to go back now to VMware. Uh, I booted the image. If you've got this far, you would have booted the image, and then it's going to show you a console, a TTY console that looks vaguely like this with some blue text that says staccato, staccato management console at, and it gives you an, uh, a host name or an IP address. Now, how many people have got to this point so far? Okay, good. This is, at least it's possible to get there. And uh, how many people here are not inclined to use one on your laptop and you'd like to get access to the cloud? So I've got, that's great. I've got, I think I've got 15 instances I can hand out. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll, while everybody else is still on those steps that I gave previously, I'll hand out some, some VMs or some cloud instances. And I do recommend that you at, at least, if you're, if you're um, wanting to get the most out of this, that you do at least either do it on your laptop or on the cloud if, if possible. I'm really hoping that um, I can illustrate some of the power of this thing. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, what should I do here? It's not terribly visible. I should have cleaned up my laptop before I started this. So, here is uh, an example of a, of basically, um, what we call a micro cloud. It's an instance of Staccato, it's a PaaS, but this one's available out on the internet somewhere. Wi -Fi, so yeah, that's the other thing. <clears throat> I, brought, I was told the network here is really flaky, which really concerns me because this is a cloud-based tutorial and what's the cloud without the network? I'd basically be, be hobbled without the, without the internet. So I brought in my own access point. Maybe I'll put that on here too. And um, this access point the uh, SSID is Camelot. You're welcome to join this one. The password is Cafe Babe. It it's, comes from the Java world. Um, Cafe Babe is the password. So if you want to join this network, I think you'll have more likelihood of getting on. But the network today has been a little um, iffy. So this will allow you to get on the net, and it will allow you to hopefully access either the uh, external cloud, the external instance that I'm setting up for you, or it'll allow you, your internal instance to access the bits it needs in order to deploy software. So what I'm going to do then is I will identify the people in here that would like an external cloud, and I'll give you each an individual IP address. And so um, who's first? I think you said, OK. So this one is for you. Uh, so and who's next? Okay, I'll give you 67 instead of, sorry, 167 instead of 166. 168. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm ready, but. Okay, thank you. Okay. Did you want one? Uh, I'm okay. sorry, what, what is this? Oh, this is for the people that don't have it on your laptop. Oh, I'm sorry. If you have it on your laptop, ignore this part. I just want to make sure everybody can get, um, get an access to a cloud. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm going to have trouble remembering who's got what, um, but I'll try. So I gave you 168. Try 169, 170, 171, and good. So I'm just typing 170 in place of the 160. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I should have put a, so right here, XXX. And let me know if you can get there. Well, let me know more to the point if you didn't get it. Did you want one? So you're going to have 70, 172. Site security certificate not trusted. Correct. So there's self-signed certs on these things for a reason I'll tell you shortly, which is probably obvious. Um, so just click through the cert. Just assume it's trusted. I won't do anything malicious, I promise. At least not today in this room to you guys. <laughs> so. Whoops. Stepping out of range of the camera. 
So of the people that I've handed out these things, are, they, are you able to get uh, a console, basically? Or is anybody not able to see the console? And the console, or the, the screen you'll get, will look like this. And once you've get, gotten there, type in your email address or basically anything you want, as long as it's an email address. Foo at bar.com is fine. It doesn't matter. It's just used to identify you. And then choose a password. And then we'll, um, we'll get going with this. For the people that have internal VMs running that look like this, hopefully, how many people see this? One, two, three, OK. So I've got a handful. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm, I see, I'm happy to see there's a few Macs in. Is there any PCs in here? Oh, yeah. I'm happy to see there's some Macs in the room. Uh, the Mac, it works a little bit better on the Mac because Staccato publishes its DNS address to the Mac internal DNS, however that works. And it allows you to actually access this thing directly. If you're on Windows, you have to do another step, which I'll get to shortly. But on the Mac, what you would do is type in, um, you'll look at this thing that says Staccato Management Console at HTTPS colon slash slash staccato dash h7rk.local. The last four characters there before the dot local is randomly generated, so it'll be different for you. And if I type this in a browser, what is that? H7RK. So HTTPS API dot staccato H7RK dot local. Cross my fingers. So it gives me the untrusted thing again. And then it gives me the console that you had seen earlier. You'll probably see one that says, uh, enter a username and password. Again, choose anything you want as long as it's a valid e email address for the username. So what I'm going to do now is I've sort of given you some steps to get started. Feel free to keep poking away at it. And in a few minutes, I'll pause and walk around and make sure that um, you're all up to speed. But meantime, I'm going to now change channels briefly and just give you a brief overview uh, of what this thing, what we're doing is, and why I think it's, it's so powerful. And before I do that, um, I just want to um, ask a couple of questions. So who, who in this room is, is familiar with the concept of platform as a service? OK. And uh, who here has developed with um, multiple languages other than Python? And could you just give shout out some of the languages? Java. 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 See, what, what was that? PHP, Perl, OK. Um, any other ones that JavaScript. weren't? JavaScript, cool. <laughs> Ruby. Ruby, great. Excellent. That's uh, good to know. That'll actually be relevant very shortly. So, so once you get out of this session, you'll have a, a pretty good understanding of what PaaS, what, sorry, I keep saying PaaS. PaaS stands for Platform as a Service. And you'll have a good understanding of what it will provide to a development team or organization, and, uh, or an individual, for sure. Oh, thank you. And with that, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about it so you can get a, a feel for why, well, hopefully a feel for why I'm so excited about it. So in this section of this tutorial, I'm going to briefly talk about the cloud and why it's cool. And I'll talk about this as convergence thing, AAS convergence that I'm seeing. And then we'll talk about PaaS and the PaaS landscape. <clears throat> so starting off with the cloud. So the cloud is basically, uh, you can consider it like the electric utility for computing resources. So you know how you can plug you know, your toaster into the wall and it just works. Well, it's kind of like that with the cloud. Um, effectively, it enables you to get computing resources on demand when you want them. And somebody else deals with all the hassles of an infinite number of things that are definitely hassles. So um, it, it basically takes the load off. So if you've used Heroku or AWS or Google App Engine, you'll know that you don't actually have to do a lot of the upfront work. If you were to build a similar system, imagine trying to build a, a large scaled app in your basement or, or even in your corporate data center. It's a fair amount of work to deal with all the underlying issues, backups and high availability and just network isolation. And it just goes on and on and on. So the cloud basically takes over a lot of this stuff for us. So and, um, these acronyms that end with AAS 
are just propagating all over the place. So there's software as a service and platform as a service and backups as a service and I could go on and on. There's probably about 100 of them. And uh, effectively the cloud is, is computing resources as a service. So that's what Amazon or AWS is giving us or Google App Engine or a whole bunch of other like that. But anyway, it's on demand. So in other words, if you need more resources, you just say, I want more resources and you get them. I need more CPU, I need more disk. <clears throat> it's also self-service. You don't typically have to submit a ticket to an IT department to get more disk. You just go to a web page and click a button or something is generally how it would work. It's also ideally scalable, which is good for a lot of applications being built these days where you actually might need to take advantage of scaling. And um, also because of the nature of this, it needs to be measurable because these people that are providing these things have to charge for them somehow. So they need to be able to measure how much of everything, how many VM instances, how many CPU, how much CPU, um, everything, disk and network and on and on. So these are some of the characteristics of the cloud and some of the advantages of using the cloud. And this is sort of more directed at IT people or, or CIOs, but it reduces your cost, better use, utilization of resources. Um, aut everything's automated as opposed to manual everything. And, and al also as a result, if it's manual, it's very, it tends to be fragile. Uh, and I'm talking about configuring systems and deploying them it tends to be very fragile. Very uh, flexible, uh, just basically flexible to your requirements and needs. And um, agile, I don't know. For an agile shop, um, this would be a nice way to build up a, a, a quick app if you need it, get it deployed. And it's very good for IT. If they can take it, once they've got on board with this, um, a lot of the time that they would otherwise be spending dealing with these piddly little issues, like I need a database instance, and that could take three or four days in a typical enterprise organization. That's being actually optimistic, I've found. <clears throat> with uh, cloud and all that, it can happen in minutes or seconds. So. From, uh, I, I really want to focus on this from the developer's perspective as opposed to the IT or the CIO or all those folks. This, for me, this is about, and, and, and my whole view on this is from the viewpoint of a developer. And uh, so here's sort of three aspects of the, the cloud, or I guess four, that uh, you've probably heard of. But there's obviously the underlying hardware that needs to run all this stuff. Thank you. And then on top of that is the infrastructure layer. Infrastructure as a service is called. And then on top of that is platform as a service, which is today's focus. And on top of that is software as a service. So I'm going to cover these three. I'm going to pause for a minute to get everybody up to speed on where we're at with the, um, with the VMs. And uh, yeah, keep on. So software as a service, well, that, I think it was a decade ago that this term was first coined. And you've probably, you know, the most famous um, instance of this to date is Salesforce. They kind of move this forward more than anybody else. Uh, effectively, it's software. Instead of installing this bloated thing onto your PC or into your local network or whatever, um, it's available in the cloud. It's available on the internet. It's, all it is is a, it's an application running on the internet instead of running on a local system. So it's hosted in the cloud. Typically, not always, but typically you'll have a thin client to access this thing. So if you've used Salesforce, you're in using with a, brow a browser. Gmail is another example. It's a cloud-based software as a service. So um, you can use a uh, web browser to access your Gmail, or you can use a, um, any mail client if you like. But the point is it takes the burden of a ton of work off of the organization that's trying to deliver the software. It takes the burden off of them and allows, um, allows the developers, or let's say the users, sorry, to just focus on what they need to do. Like um, some examples that are common are ERP apps or human resources apps or email or the list does go on all over. But anyway, that's software as a service, which is interesting to the people, the developers, the people in this room, because you'll probably be building a lot of these things, hopefully, and also ideally you'll be taking advantage of them as well. I'm sure you have many already. So that's the software layer. So remember the three layers I'm talking about. Software at the top, infrastructure at the bottom, just over the hardware. The infrastructure layer, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but this is kind of, in my view as a programmer, this is all the stuff that 
I kind of find a little tedious to deal with when I'm trying to build up a really cool <clears throat> application. Uh, so all the, you know, storage and hardware and servers and the network isolation, making sure that, you know, that there's no security issues with the network. Um, security is another uh, huge area that has to be dealt with here. Um, backups, billing, I don't know, it just goes on. Dynamic scaling, virtualization, all this stuff is really things that me as a software developer, I don't want to be dealing with it. I'm not good at it. I don't really understand the intricacies. And I'd much rather spend my time writing code. So this is the infrastructure layer, IAAS. There's some, you know, there's infrastructure providers out there like AWS is an infrastructure provider. They give you the infrastructure and you get to build on top of that. So that's the IAAS, infrastructure as a service layer. But what gets me going is the platform as a service layer. It's for developers, it's, that's who it's for. It's targeted directly at you guys in this room, you people in this room, sorry. Um, it's for developers. Uh, typically, it's, and it's a lot of things more than it's on this slide, but typically it's multi-tenant. That means you can have multiple applications completely isolated and separate running on a single platform as a service platform, basically. Automated app hosting. So if you've installed um, a lot of applications on large servers, typically there's a lot of hassle involved to do so. You have to download things and consult documentation and get all the dependencies together and uh, then get services like databases and maybe message brokers, message bus services, and I could just go on and on and on. And uh, what the PaaS does is it, it eliminates a lot of this work for you. You don't have to do much of it. Um, services and rain, uh, frameworks and runtime. So platform, PaaS, I'm just going to call it PaaS from now on. You, you know I mean platform as a service. Uh, it provides or is compatible with a large number of services, database services and various app containers and um, also frameworks. So I come from the Java realm, so Spring's very popular with Java developers and, and there's the Java EE framework and all this other stuff. Um, but if you're a Ruby person, Ruby on Rails or Sinatra, there's all these frameworks available. And in the Python world, you know, the WSGI and, and all the frameworks associated with it, um, Django, etc. And then runtimes. So a runtime in this case means um, Java world, Java 6 or Java 7, or it might be a different version of Python or a different version of Perl. But it, uh, so the term polyglot in the world of PaaS means that it supports multiple languages. And every language that anybody shouted out five minutes ago um, is supported on most platform as a service products today. So first I'll pause for questions or comments or anything. This is kind of a high level start, but we're gonna dive real soon, deep. Uh, and then the next question is, how many people here are not yet able to get um, this displayed? or something like it. Okay, okay, and everybody else is, that's great. Very close, maybe I'll, should I leave you a couple of seconds to fiddle with it? And who, who would like help? And then I'll just take a, like a one minute break here. And I apologize, I was supposed to have a, ah, the uh, password for the, uh, the network is here. Does anybody recognize this phrase? <laughs> no. There's a magic number in, on Unix systems that identifies what the file is, typically for binary files. And it's at the very first few bytes of the file. And the Java guys, they decided they'd use cafe bay. That has to be in hex, or at least it's represented in hex, so. For what it's worth, virtual box and bridge mode totally didn't work on the PyCon Wi-Fi. As soon as it switched to that, it worked. Okay, so you're in NAT mode? Yeah. Thank you. Well, no, no, NAT mode didn't work. NAT mode booted up, but gave me the error saying it was NAT mode. When I switched to bridge mode, the VM just hung while booting. Okay. And that was on the PyCon Wi-Fi. Switching to that Wi-Fi, it immediately booted up. Oh, good. Thank you for telling me. Um, I'm not surprised, and that's why I brought this thing. Um, ideally, um, if you're having troubles, as, as this gentleman suggested, um, try to connect to that network, and it might allow you in. And that would be this guy here. So the Camelot is the SSID.
staccato dash four characters. Oh. Yeah. And you're on a Mac. Really? That's yeah. kind of odd. Oh, okay. That'll be, you never know. Um, so I hop networks all the time and I encounter no end of difficulties like that. If your VPN is not going to give you a second IP address or, you know, DHP address or whatever. Yeah, I would say if possible, get off VPN. I find that's often a, and, and reboot your VM for sure. Once you've done that. Okay. How, uh, anybody want, uh, I, I'll take a minute or two, just uh, my apologies, but hopefully it won't interrupt the flow too much. I have access to a large team of people up in Vancouver, Canada, that um, are kind of waiting for questions from me um, because they know that I'm not a Python expert and I don't want to humiliate myself too much. So if you have some hard Python questions I can't answer, I just, I have instant access and I'll be able to get an answer. And the other thing I want to say is if you're on Windows, I mentioned it earlier, Staccato is um, often unable, or maybe always unable, to publish its, it, its host name that it generated here, h7rk in my case, staccato h7rk.local. It's unable to publish it to the Windows DNS or whatever Windows does. Um, so in order to get around that, there's a, there is a workaround. So if you've booted it up and you see this like this, you can just type l to log in. The username is staccato. The password is staccato as well. And I'm going to take a, a little divergence and talk about this um, thing called uh, zip.io, xip.io. So this is an external DNS resolver, and it's kind of cool. You can use this for any host you want. And the way it works is if you have a host name called 192.168.1.42.xip.io, 
That's, a, that's actually a valid DNS name, and it goes to the external global DNS to resolve it. And this domain sitting at xip.io, these guys here, they um, grab that address and they parse it and they extract the IP address from it and send it back to you. So this is a way you can instantly create a DNS name for any system you want. Let me show you an example. Um, if I go ping google.com right now, I get an IP address. Here it is. 74.125.224.168. Okay, so there's an IP address. Um, but what if I want a host name for whatever reason? I can go ping um, foo.bar, I think this will work, dot, that address, dot .xip .io. And it actually, or I could actually do it in a browser too, foo.baz.that.xip.io. I think this will work. And it resolved to Google. So this allows you to, on the fly, create a valid, globally known DNS name for anything you want. I use this all the time, and I highly recommend. And, uh, pardon me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's not a big deal. Um, so I use this all the time, but it's very useful for Staccato because um, Staccato, and similar, if you, if you do a lot of web, web app development, you might, you know, I, I'm, again, I'm from Java, but in Tomcat, you can do virtual hosting. So you can access the app by its host name, but not by its IP address. And it's the same with Staccato. Um, so where was I? What you'll do here is, first of all, determine the IP address that you were given for this VM. And it shows it in that screen, but just to make sure you've got it, just type in if config eth0 in this VM, and it'll show you the inet address of something like 192.168.91.152. With that in hand, the next thing you will do is go kato node rename, type in that IP address, what is that? 91.152.xip.io. So we're going to rename this thing from that H7RK or whatever, H7, yeah, HF7RK, to this new name. This is actually a new valid host name known to the global DNS. And I hit return on that, and it's, it takes a second. It stops and starts a bunch of stuff. But what this will, the end result of this is it will rename this VM to that one we just gave it, and it'll be known to the global DNS. Now, that IP address for this guy is not routable, so if you're in you know, Germany, you won't be able to hit 192.0.zip.io, it won't get to your system, obviously. But it'll be great for you and your laptop, and um, actually, if you're on this network, then you'll be able to access other people's instances with their zip.io address, and it'll work fine, and I'll show you that shortly. So that'll allow you at least, and, and the reason I'm saying all this is because on Windows, you need to do it effectively. If you're on the Mac, it does it for you with that h7rk.local thing. But on Windows, um, because it doesn't publish to the internal Windows DNS, you need to do this extra step. It seems to be the same gig on Linux. You need to do this as well. You're probably right. I haven't tried it. So are you using KVM? Or what are you using as a virtualization? Uh, no, I'm using VirtualBox. Oh, VirtualBox, right. And as a hint to some of the things to come, you'll see some of the services that are starting and stopping. MongoDB is an example, and um, Reddit, I mean Rabbit, MQ, sorry, Redis, a few other things. So we'll, we'll talk about those. Did you have a question? Um, for PC, what kind of network mode should we use for VirtualBox? Um, if you're on this network, use Bridged. And maybe auto-detect Bridged if that's an option. And if not, just bridged. I guess it's got a pull down that says NAT or bridged or something. Well, if you're not on the network, you're just on your machine. If, if you're on this network. But if you're just on the local machine. Oh, you're not on any network. Uh, you, you're pretty much going to have to be on a network for this for the next couple hours, if possible. Um, I could maybe string you a. Ah. Um, Oh, I see. Which network are you on? Uh, PyCon. Okay. Yeah, I suspect the PyCon network is not going to cooperate with us. So if, if possible, connect to this guy. If, if you're unable to connect, there is a workaround, but you'll, you'll miss a few of the things I'll be showing later. Um, because when we're deploying, let's say, Python apps, there's dependencies that need to get downloaded from the dependency repositories, wherever they are. So. Okay, no problem. 
turn off this mic so I don't get feedback. Move over to Camelot and see if it gives you a 192. Look at that. Now go to advance and then to do not understand. DNS. I mean, not DNS. Um, uh, try TCP. Doesn't even have it. Renew. Renew. Yeah, so like, there you go. Give me a one. Come on. Okay, that's really <laughs> strange. Could you, do you have, um, are you on the Camelot network? Yeah. yeah. Are you on a 192? Will it yeah. work on the PyCon network? Maybe. I just haven't had a time to try so it out very much. I have an I, a, a address of 50.201. That is really strange. Okay, well then I'll, maybe it'll work for you. But so try the, try rebooting with any luck.
sorry. In the interest of time, I will have, let's move on. Let's get it, let's start to get into some of the more interesting stuff. Um, so, let's see, keynote. I think I'm gonna, um, I really wanna get started doing some coding here. Let's take three more minutes though and just talk a little bit more about stuff. Because it is kind of important background, I think. So, summarize to date, PaaS, Platform as a Service, is directed directly at the people in this room. It's for software developers of, on teams of any size, organizations of any size, from individuals to startups to Fortune 100, whatever, it doesn't matter. This is for those, for all of developers in my view. So some examples of platform services are, that are out there are, um, Heroku is a good example, Sales, uh, Salesforce is, they, they own Heroku. Um, Google App Engine is a uh, platform as a service. You can create an app and push it up to Google App Engine, no problem at all. Same with Engine Yard, they're more focused on Ruby on Rails applications, although I believe they're expanding. So, but these are some of the PaaS providers. Now, I wanna mention a platform as a service called Cloud Foundry which has been pretty important in the whole development of Platform as a Service. It's, uh, Cloud Foundry is an open source PaaS, which you can grab the bits for anytime you want and put them on your laptop and use them, kind of like Staccato, except Cloud Foundry is open source. Staccato is a fork of Cloud Foundry, so we recognized its power. We wanted to embellish it a lot, and we were unable to with the Cloud Foundry source base, code base, so we took their bits and basically forked it and now we have Staccato, but it's all part of the same thing. So it's an open source platform for multi-language, multi-framework, multi-service, cloud-hosted apps. Okay, so we'll get into all of this shortly. And uh, there's several variants of this, um, AppFog and a few others that are similar to Staccato, similar to Cloud Foundry, they all work basically the same. So if you've seen Cloud Foundry, what we're talking about today applies, but the concepts apply to any platform as a service where I'm coming from here. Okay, so that was a brief interlude. Now let's get back to some more interesting stuff. So um, what I'd like you to do if possible is um, log into your, your uh, it's gonna work, or did I shut it down? Uh, da -da -da -da. I think I, sh oh yeah, I, I renamed it so I can't use it, so that's fine. Um, that's fine. I'm going to use one of, uh, one of yours. Um, I'm going to use one of these guys because it doesn't matter. So uh, let's go 166. I don't know whose that is, but I, won't, I promise I won't interfere with what you're doing. Oh, except that I don't have a login on here. <laughs> all right, let's go to one that maybe will work. No, all right. In that case, I'll go to... Could, could someone tell me what the highest number I handed out now? 182. Did I hand out 182? Okay, that one's mine. <laughs> Phew. And then I'll get, oh, sorry. Oh, 162 is online. Okay, I can just use that one. <laughs> Hopefully, oh, maybe not. <sighs> okay, great. There's several ways you can control and manage your paths. There's, um, so I'll get into the architecture shortly. It's pretty interesting, I think. Um, but just for now, suffice to say that there's a controller that manages the paths that sits behind uh, effectively a REST interface, or it's a REST-like interface. It's a HTTP, HTTP API, which you can use to manage the paths. And there are a number of clients available allowing you to manage it from these various clients. There's a web client we have here. Underneath this web client <clears throat> is code that actually that talks REST or whatever, talks HTTP to the cloud controller. And it, set, it asks it things and, and requests it to do things and whatever. There's also command line clients. There's a number of clients, they're plugins to the common IDEs. Uh, if you've used Eclipse or, or, or um, uh, IntelliJ for Java, um, or, or various IDEs. Komodo is a, a good example of an IDE with, that has a plugin available for Cloud Foundry and for Staccato. We're using the web interface here, so let's, uh, let's just briefly explore it just to, to get started. Um, I guess that's right. 
So I'll, I'll run through some of the tabs. You're welcome to do the same. The overview should just give you an overview of some of the things running on here. I was fiddling with this system a couple of days ago, so it's got some weird things. Um, but let's talk about this. So it supports the concepts of users. And typically, an, uh, a development company would have a number of teams that are working on developing a product. And it's not just the dev teams. There might be a number of dev, but there's also QA. There's the deployment team, the test team. There's the um, uh, maybe marketing or sales wants access to this thing as well for whatever reason. Um, so you can create multiple users and multiple groups. The users and groups are assigned limits and otherwise um, controlled as what they can do. So let me just show you the kind of thing that you can do. You can limit or associate a certain amount of memory that this user can use. You can say I, I, this user can only deploy like 10 applications or 5 applications. And it can use five services, meaning MySQL or MongoDB or whatever. And then it um, shows you a number of, thing, number of things about the users. And I can change some of these limits. I can say, well, this user shouldn't have root access to these VMs. So you can turn that off if that's a concern. Or I can change the amount of memory allocated or services or applications or application URIs. There's all these things you can um, configure with this. Um, but what I want to show you, before we dive into some of the other stuff, is what we call the App Store. The App Store is a repository of applications that you can deploy to your cloud with the click of a button. And um, if you look at the App Store, you'll see there's some pull downs here. And the first thing you can say is, well, um, sorry. The first thing you can choose with this pull down is which runtime you'd like. So do I want Perl or Python, Java? JavaScript, PHP, Ruby, whatever. So I, I could choose one of these guys. And um, I'll start with Java. And it gives me some example Java applications which I can deploy. And um, Jenkins is a good example. Jenkins is a continuous integration platform allowing, it's very powerful for development teams. Um, I've used it for years. It used to be called Hudson until Oracle. I won't even go there. It used to be called Hudson. It's now called Jenkins. Um, I installed it back in, I don't know, 2003 or something. And it took me a couple of days to install this thing. There was database services and tons of config, and it was just a real pain in the butt. And today, I can, <clears throat> I can install Jenkins with the click of a button. Now, it's not letting me here, but I think it's because I was messing around with this VM. Could someone just verify that you can, you don't have to install it, but um, there is an install icon, yeah. Let's, let's do something a little bit different then. So let's, instead of, um, instead of that, let's look at, uh, I don't know. Let's go to Node for a second, JavaScript. Right? There's a couple of JavaScript developers in the room. Wow, look at this. This VM is totally messed up. I can't do anything with it. So what I'm going to do, oh, look at this. I may be able to just do this. Let's name 192.168.91.152. .xip.io. Ha, I got one. Phew. So this is the one that's, now I'm looking at the one on my laptop. I remember my password. And if I go to App Store now, let's see if I can actually install something. So I choose runtime. I'll go back to Java because I'd like to see Jenkins. It's really big. And I click install. And it tells me, well, this, this app's going to use that much memory, and it's going to be called Jenkins.something that it generates. I'm just going to call it Jenkins.john. And I'll just hit install. So what this is doing is it's finding the bits for this application, pushing them up to the cloud that you created. The, um, we call it the micro cloud, but it's the VM that you installed earlier. And then it's... Um, also finding any dependencies that are associated with Jenkins. It's also installing any associated services like databases or message brokers and uh, a bunch of stuff like that. And then eventually at the end of this whole thing, it will, you'll have a working running instance of Jenkins running in your micro cloud. So the point is that instead of spending, I don't know, 30 hours or five hours even, um, you know, downloading and then reading documentation and installing and, and running up against errors. Instead of all that stuff, 
it's a simple click of a button, okay? So um, we'll get into how that works, and I'll show you how you can do it with your Python apps or if you're using you know, Ruby or, or JavaScript or whatever. Um, I'll show you how you can do all that. That's kind of some of what we'll be focusing on today. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I don't know what the network bandwidth is like in here. It's my experience so far. It's been pretty bad. I did a speed test last night when there was no attendees around, and I had 22K down, um, which is, you know, <laughs> that's dial-up <laughs> speed, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be issues here. But hopefully with the Python stuff, we won't have. Jenkins is, is huge. But let me show you how this works, because it's really interesting, I think. Um, if you go to the Settings tab, you'll see App Store URLs. These are just URLs that point to the applications that are available. And I'm going to click one of these guys. And it shows me um, what these, how the store is defined. Again, a store isn't a store. There's no money exchanging hands. It's really just a repository of apps you can install at the click of a button. What the store is, it's defined in YAML, um, just a markup language. And uh, similar, you know, not so, you can compare it with XML, kind of. Um, I'm sure you guys all know this stuff. Um, what the YAML defines is some metadata about the actual repository itself, so the base URL for this thing. And in this case, it's on GitHub. So all the apps in the App Store right now are just on GitHub. And um, then it shows metadata about individual apps. It might, excuse me, it might show the, uh, the name of the app, the description, the framework it uses, the runtime, um, an icon, so is whatever's shown in the, um, in the uh, app store, like this icon here, for example. So it's just metadata. The point here, though, is that a corporation or a company or a team or anybody could create their own app store really easily just by um, creating some YAML that points to your applications. It can be in GitHub. It can be in a local Git repository. It's completely uh, independent of the, SC, the source code management system being used. So Git or Perforce or Subversion or whatever you're using will be fine. Um, most of the stuff we're doing here is, will be in Git. Um, but anyway, the point is you create a repository of applications, you describe them with this YAML, and then they're available in the, uh, in the console, basically, to load. So let's see how that install is going. Um, get rid of that. Applications. All right, so. So, so if I have a Python app that's written in NumPy, I would load not NumPy up into the App Store first and then also... Okay, so here's where my ignorance will show blaringly. I don't know what NumPy is. It's just a numerical package that a lot of ah. Python programs... So actually, that's, so the question is, I have an app that's using this, this Python package, NumPy in this case. Um, what do I need to do to get it to work here? Um, you actually ideally won't have to do anything except push your app to staccato as long as you've got some indication in your app bundle that says, here's a requirement. I've seen, in Python, I've seen typically requirements.txt um, is a, and again, I don't know a lot about this, but it, it indicates the dependencies for the application. And I can talk about this because in Java, it's, you know, use, a, use Maven and a POM, and you say, here's all the things I need with this app. You push the app to the cloud, and then it goes, oh, well, I need, you know, this JSON parser, and I need this security mechanism, or whatever, the security package. And it just goes and grabs all the bits. Okay, so the alternative is you could also bundle them with your app in the app directory. And we'll see some of this shortly. You bundle them with your app, and then you can, um, uh, then it, you don't rely on an external repo, which might be a problem in a company that had like a VPN thing, or, you know, might isolate the users, or you might not want to rely on an external repo if you're doing some production work. So it says NAN, huh, let's see, I why. I don't know what that means. So I'm, I, I think what's happening here, I'm guessing, is that the, yeah, it's, it's still waiting. So it's trying to get this, get the bits for this thing and it's still not. Is anybody, just out of curiosity, anybody were able to install anything just now? I got a Oh, did you? Cool, wow. You're using the remote, right. Okay, so of course. So it's, on, it's in its fast, massive pipe, and it's just able to talk to GitHub and get everything. I'm sitting here in the PyCon Convention Center, and, or Santa Clara, and there's no, uh, no bandwidth for me. But anyway, you get the point. 
Um, if you'd like to download something simple, you can also choose, uh, this might actually work for me, is if you go to JavaScript or Node, there's one called Env here, E-N-V, and it's a trivial app that all it does is, <coughs> excuse me, all this app does is uh, print your environment. So I deployed it with the click of a button. It went real fast this, this time. It hasn't been started yet. You'll see up here it says stopped uh, because by default it won't start the app for you. Um, but let's start it. So I click start. It'll actually launch the app. And once it's launched, I'll wait for it to launch. And here, env is here. So I click env dash, that funny name it generated. It shows me a URL for this thing. So if I click that URL, this is the app running. So here's a you know, full stack. It's JavaScript based on Node running inside my cloud that I can access from a browser. If you ran Jenkins, it's the same thing. Um, the whole Jenkins stack is now running in your cloud at your beck and call. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make here is just it's fairly straightforward to deploy apps from the App Store to your micro cloud without fiddling with a lot of dependencies and, and uh, external packages and all this stuff. It just kind of just works. And most of the time, that's actually true. While we're here looking at the applications, so I've got three applications that are deployed to this thing. Jenkins, in my case, is still, I assume it's still, oh, look at that. It finished. All right, let's start Jenkins up for the people that haven't seen it. And we'll spend a minute looking at this. Um, this is the console for Staccato. It's all accessed by, as I said, by over a REST interface effectively. So any client of this thing can do similar of what we're doing right now. And I don't know why it's taking a while. I'll, I'll uh, wait for a sec. Meanwhile, let's go to another one of these apps, uh, Env here. And uh, it's showing me it's got one instance deployed of this app, a single instance. Two gigs of disk space have been allotted, 64 megs of memory, and it can use 256 file descriptors. You can edit all of these things if you want it to use more or less. Um, the, U, the web UI has also, has, you know, you can choose like, you can choose 4096, but if you wanted 4095, you'd have to do it through another means. Um, it shows you the URL for it. And then it shows you, at the bottom, it shows you about the instances themselves. So just running through some of this, the instance ID is just a, a number starting at zero that identifies each instance, how much memory is being used, how much disk is being used. The DEA host, I'll get to that shortly, but it's effectively, it's the IP address on which this thing is running. And it says it started, it says when it was started, and uh, allows me to look at some log files. These are the standard log files that you just expect with an application. So um, in the case of this app, there's a standard out log that it would print stuff to. Not very interesting, but that's what shows up on standard out. Standard error if there's any errors. And uh, the staging log is the logs that showed what happened when the app was pushed, in case you're interested. But. Okay, how's everything so far? Any, any questions or? Okay, did you try it on yours or on the external one? On the internet, so I guess it would fail. Yeah. Um, again, it's network issues probably. Yeah. Um, now, I've had, oh man, I started this job in September, and in, on September the 6th or something, and like the, the 20th or 25th of September, I had to go do a talk because someone else couldn't make it, kind of like today. <laughs> and, and I, I got there kind of feeling excited. I knew mostly what I was doing. And I got there and there was no network whatsoever. And it was just a nightmare experience. So I had to basically resort to just screenshots. Um, when this thing is off net, it's, it's really not designed to work off net. It's just it's not designed that way. You can do it, but it takes a lot of configuration that I was incapable of doing in front of like 60 people. So again. I was, I was on the network. Right. So. My point is that, yeah, the network, flaky networks cause problems. So I can, I can look at it, though, try to get it. Um, um, maybe turn break. Yeah, okay, let's do that in a couple minutes, so. Okay, having said that, let's go back to here and just run through a couple more things. I wanna take a little break again and talk to, just run through very quickly some of the things that PaaS will give you. Um, so the, kind of the model is, 
Staccato is the example I'm using here, but it applies to any, any platform as a service. It sits on top of the infrastructure layer. So we talked about IAS. So here's some infrastructure providers like you know, Amazon, AWS, or, or VMware um, has all sorts available. There's an initiative called OpenStack, which is an infrastructure layer, an open source infrastructure layer that you can deploy in your basement or deploy in your <coughs> behind your corporate firewall. That sits underneath all this. Then the PaaS sits on top of the infrastructure, basically. And the PaaS provides all of this stuff. So, you know, it's got Drupal is out of the box, and Ruby on Rails is out of the box, and, and um, Perl, the, camel, the Perl camel is there, and Java, obviously, and Python. Uh, WordPress, <coughs> Sugar CRM, I haven't seen that before. Um, I should know this. What's the turtle? What's that little turtle on the left? Um, what was it, Bugzilla? Or Mozilla, okay, interesting. Anyway, that's kind of this, this stack, and I'll go into more detail, because I think it's kind of interesting and informative how it actually works. But before I do that, so um, it supports multiple languages. Uh, so typically it supports multiple languages. And um, so Java and Ruby and Perl and Python, all these were mentioned earlier, JavaScript, PHP, .NET typically, um, and then Erlang is another example. And then um, there's a whole class of languages that run on top of the J Java virtual machine, uh, like Scala and Groovy and Clojure, et cetera, JRuby, Jython. I guess that's the one of interest here. Yes? Where does OpenStack fit into the platform as a service? I know it's infrastructure as a service, but can you run that instead of Staccato? Good question. So the question is, can I run OpenStack instead of Staccato? And the answer is no. Well. The answer is that OpenStack is an infrastructure layer. So OpenStack is here. So it gives you all of the infrastructure stuff, like backups and network isolation and provisioning of, of systems. But it doesn't give you any of the stuff that is designed for developers. So sure, you can use OpenStack to get yourself a VM or a thousand VMs and you know, re replicate them. But you won't be able to then take Jenkins and install Jenkins on, open, on an OpenStack cluster, let's say, without doing a ton of extra work on top of it. Does that answer it? It's, it sort of um, it raises you up a level. If you just start with bare, a bare virtual machine or a bare farm of virtual machines, there's a lot of work involved to actually get applications running, on, or there's some work involved to get apps running on there. Um, for example, Jenkins, you need the Java virtual machine. So you have to make sure that JVM's installed on all these guys. You need MySQL installed. And it just, it actually is a, a lot of work for someone. A PaaS will alleviate all of that. Can you run OpenStack underneath and Staccato on top? Yes, and oh, what a great question. Yes, the question is can you run OpenStack and Staccato? And yes. Um, and in fact, everybody that I handed out a one of these guys to, I just closed my uh, presentation tool. Um, those addresses there, that's actually on an OpenStack cluster running um, from a company called Cloud Scaling that provides an OpenStack uh, uh, platform called OCS, the Open Cloud oh man, System, maybe? have to go look it up. Um, so, every, so what I did was this morning under great duress, I launched a whole bunch of VMs on the OpenStack platform in order to make sure that they were, this is when I discovered there was no network in Santa Clara Convention Center. Um, so I spawned, uh, I think, 25 VMs, and I was able to uh, get them booted up, the first 15 of them or so. And that's running on OpenStack. So if you're using those guys, then yeah, you're on OpenStack. But PaaS is sitting on top of that. Oh, good, it's still here. Um, so there's a whole class of Java languages out there. Um, anybody use Jython? I'm curious. Hmm, OK. Um, JRuby is analogous to Jython. It's basically Jython's Python written that runs on top of the JVM. And my understanding is, uh, so back to the Ruby. I, I know with, with Python, there's, there's um, the GIL, the global interpreter lock thing. Um, if you use Jython, you're not encumbered with that. And same with JRuby. You don't have all the threading issues. The threading constraints that you have with Ruby, you get to alleviate, get past those with JRuby because it's built on a much more thread-aware environment, Java. It's very, very uh, well capable of dealing with threads. So it's, it's kind of interesting. But anyway, the point I'm trying to get to here is that 
the PaaS will support all of these languages, no problem. Same with uh, framework. So in a Java world, Spring or Play, in uh, the Ruby world, you've got Ruby on Rails or Sinatra. Uh, Scala has Lyft. Um, Groovy has Grails, Ruby on Rails. There's Node.js for JavaScript. There's Flask and Bottle and Django for people around here. Um, all these frameworks are supported out of the box with Staccato, as we'll see. And then there's also uh, the, uh, the concept of app servers or containers, which house these applications you're running. So if you're, if you're building Java web apps, you're probably using something like Tomcat or Glassfish or JBoss or something. And uh, uh, now, my understanding is most Python general stuff uses the WSGI. I don't know if that's actually true. It is supported out of the box as things like uh, the G Unicorn is based on the WSGI. The point is, these are all available and ready to use in your PaaS, and um, you don't have to configure them or install them or all that stuff. It's just there. A few more things, and then we'll get back to actually using this thing. Um, I talked about users and groups, which allows you to say, well, all the people in QA can use up a maximum of 12 gigs, and the people in you know, marketing can use 5K or something, and whatever. Um, so you can, you can group your users and then assign them limits and permissions. So on top of this, so a PaaS will typically provide you a number of services which can be very handy when you're trying to build an application like database services, including traditional relational database um, packages like MySQL or, or Postgres and the, the more modern, I guess, MongoDB and others. Um, there's a whole host of these things. Message brokers, if you're using a message bus, um, ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ, just ready out of the box. Memcached, um, file system, it's kind of an interesting concept. What is the meaning of a file system in a cloud when you have applications that are distributed across multiple servers or multiple data centers across multiple con continents? It suddenly gets a little bit more challenging. But the PaaS takes care of all that for you to make sure that either you have an isolated file system to do your stuff on for your app, or you have a shared file system or some mix of them. So it takes care of most of that for you. And it takes care of managing this stuff, um, configuring the databases, replication and sharding. Kind of a pain in the butt sometimes, but ideally a PaaS will take care of this for you out of the box. Clicking a few buttons saying, I want, I want 30 shard replica sets and I want the, the shard keys to look like this. These are the parameters and it just does it for you. Um, tuning the message bus, you know, making it more optimal. And then integration with the IAAS layer. So for metering or billing or, or measuring the usage of your resources, um, it, it's kind of hooked in that way. Scaling, load balancing, things like this, app monitoring. Um, it's all built in. So, and this is, we're gonna do all this. It's actually gonna be pretty cool if I can pull this off. Um, and I think it's actually gonna work. I, I've gotten far further than I was fearing. At least most people have a, a, an instance they can play with. Um, but auto scaling, so that's another concept. So it'd be really nice if uh, my application is humming along nicely, but then um, if it suddenly needs way more resources, let's say, um, uh, familiar with the slash dot effect or the, the, the hacker news effect where, yeah, Reddit is another example where um, if your app is, is announced on one of these sites, um, suddenly instead of having, you know, 50 hits a day, you get like 30,000 in a minute kind of thing. Um, and it'd be nice, you know, I mean, typically what, what do you do in that situation? Really, there's nothing you can do. Companies have failed because of this. They, or not failed, but lost opportunity. They get announced on, on uh, slash dot or something and 10 million people go visit it and it says, you know, 404 or whatever, uh, 500, whatever you get. And uh, they go, well, that's useless and they never come back. Um, it'd be really cool if you could adapt your app to the load on the spline. And that's what auto scaling provides. So you can monitor the resource usage of this application. The PaaS will do this for you. And then when it realizes that you're running out of resources, it calls the underlying infrastructure layer, like OpenStack or whatever's underneath, AWS, and says, give me 40 new VMs and let me put my apps out there. Okay, so auto scaling also um, allows you to specify uh, limits on, you know, how, don't spawn like 60 million VMs in case, you know, I don't really want to pay for that many. 
Um, you can say I only want to do 100 maximum or something. Um, notifications. So if you want to be notified when you're reaching a limit, you can get an email or, or whatever, like any kind of alert. So that's kind of the auto scaling side. I'm going to skip this for a second and let's get back into actually using this thing. Okay. And I should have mentioned, well, yeah, this will be fine. <clears throat> So what I'm going to do is, what I'd like to do is now start actually deploying some Python apps <clears throat> to the cloud. You've all got, most of you have an access to um, uh, MicroCloud or a Staccato instance running. And what I'd like to do is if you could visit this URL here, https github.com slash staccato dash apps. And I'll go there myself. It's right there. Been there before, and this is a, a just a re, we've collected this repository of applications that run inside Staccato, just kind of for example and demo purposes. So they're on GitHub, and what you can do is um, let's grab one here. So let's choose a I don't know. Here's one Django GTD. So a GTD app for Django, written in Django, and. Uh, sitting on GitHub. If you're familiar with GitHub, you'll be comfortable with this. If not, GitHub's an incredible tool for source code management and for repositories of huge amounts of public and private uh, code, code base, basically. So, um, so here it is. If you want to, and I recommend you do this now, is download this particular um, app from GitHub. It's the source for the app that you're actually downloading. There's several ways to do this. You can, um, you know, here's a, a HTTPS link. You can hit in a browser to download it, or you can download it over SSH or whatever. And uh, there's several ways to do this. So obviously, HTTP, let's just do the HTTP one for now. In a browser, we can just visit that. Oh, I want the actual, oh, hit, click the zip button, yeah. and it'll give you the zip. It'll download the zip for you. I don't often do it from the browser. So there it is. So I've got a zip file here. And if I double click this zip file, here it is. Here's my application. It's got a, uh, it's got stuff, which it's the, it's a code for the application and one other item, which I'll talk about shortly. So does everybody have this or I'll, I'll pause until most people do. So the next question is, well, how can we push this thing to the cloud? And um, the web UI doesn't have a way to do this. You can't point it to a file, let's say, or a directory on your local system and, and push it up. It just doesn't work that way. Um, the reason behind that is because the thing that's sitting behind your web UI that we're playing with here, all this stuff is actually running on the cloud, which could be on that OpenStack instance out in San Jose somewhere. Um, so it, obviously can't access your local file system to push up the application that you're building locally, okay? So, um, that brings us to the next portion here where I'm going to talk about the command line client for the PaaS. And um, on, the, on the USB stick I handed around, I'm, I'm now realizing there will probably be people that don't have this thing. Uh, let's see, let's minimize all these guys and bring up a new one, get bigger. So, um, in order to, to work, in order for the next section to work, you'll have to obtain the client. Now, I know some of you did when I handed around the USB stick, and probably most of you don't have the client. And I apologize for not setting this up in advance. There's two ways to get it. Um, I'll encourage you to try this way. First of all, go to activestate.com slash staccato. Click the download button. And then at the bottom of this page, you'll see it says download the Staccato client. And it's small, it's not, it's not 1.4 gigs, it's a couple, it's two megs or something. And then you choose the, uh, the version for the OS that you're running, if you're on Linux or Linux 64 or 32 or Mac OS or Windows, those are your options right now. And then you would download the executable for your environment. Do this whether or not you're using a local cloud or the external um, 
cloud that I handed out to most pe several people. So once you download that, you'll get a executable, which then you can run on your Mac or on your, on your system. Um, you'll have to do this from a shell or a command line or a CLI or whatever, from a command prompt. So let's do it. I'm not going to download it because I don't want to interfere with everybody else downloading it. I happen to have it here. And latest. Um, and I have it here. So if I do a file on staccato, it shows me that it's runnable on my architecture. So if I do dot sas staccato dash version, or just version, it'll say, well, I'm running staccato client version 1.7.0. Um, maybe I'll pause to get everybody up to this point. We're going to be using this client for the rest of this entire tutorial uh, because it's very illustrative of how everything works. You get to kind of go under the covers a bit as opposed to um, doing it from the web UI where it's magically all done for you. So, um, could I, uh, maybe I'll pause for a couple of minutes, I'll answer individual questions, and meanwhile, if you could get this client downloaded from this site, um, for your particular platform, then we'll be able to move on to the next part.
So uh, we've hopefully downloaded the client. Um, I've got it here somewhere. Ideally, you want it in your path somewhere. Um, I can help you set that up if you like. So you can then, uh, or, or create an alias for it. My client is in this path. So if I'm in a, a shell of some sort, like uh, the, the bash shell that I use here, I could add it to my path by going export path, equal, path equals, and then I put the path for this guy, colon dollar path. And that'll ensure that it's in my path so that I can just type in staccato to get to it. Um, if you're using a different shell, you'll have to use slightly different syntax. If you're on Windows, um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say it, but I'll probably need some help on that. I, haven't, I don't use Windows very much. But having done that, um, now if I do which staccato, whoops, which staccato, it'll show me it's there. So no matter where I am in the file system, I can type in staccato something and it'll run it for me. So having done that, now what I did earlier was I downloaded from GitHub, I downloaded a, uh, this um, Django GTD application for staccato. So if I have a shell that's running here, uh, let me use my other shell, sorry. So let's say I want this guy. So if I CD into that directory, so I'm now in a directory where, where that um, application is. And if I look in this directory, colors aren't great. If I look in the directory, I can see what's actually contained here. And it's a, it's a standard Django application. It has the things that you would expect to, sh to show up in a Django app. And um, the one thing that you might see that's not bundled or included in a, a Django app is this thing called staccato.yaml. And this is a descriptor of the application itself, similar to what you saw in the web console. And it's, uh, it's basically metadata about the application. So this is the name of the app. I'm going to call it Django-GTD. It's going to use the Python framework. It's going to use Python 2.7. And in this uh, file here, I can do a whole bunch of things which don't, I don't want you to concern yourself with right now. Most of these YAML files are just two or three lines. They name it, they say how much memory it's going to use, and that's about it. So we'll, we'll cover some more details later. But having done that, the next thing I want to do is take this application, which is pre-built, or pre, not built, but ready to go on GitHub. I want to take it and push it to my cloud. So the first thing I need to do in order to make this work is I have to tell the staccato command. Staccato command, I have to say, well, you need to target this VM instance. So I go target API dot um, <laughs> this guy. Target that without the scheme in front. So target that. So type in this command. And um, I'm going to choose one just randomly, um, one. 81. It doesn't, it won't affect anybody here. And it says successfully targeted to this staccato instance. So now it means that any staccato command that I issue from now on that deals with the VM will talk to this one. And it's talking over again, as I said, uh, HTTP earlier. So if now I want to use it, I, I, I first issue the target command. If then I just type in staccato target, it shows me there's the IP address of this, or there's the target that I'm going to be up against. Um, not at the same time. Uh, can you target more than one? Um, no, but there's, you can easily script this stuff. It's really simple. It isn't typically, typically done that way. There's better ways to do what you're asking. Um, so that's the target. Um, what I actually think I will do is just target mine. I might as well use mine. So let's. And then you guys, you guys can all use yours. So I'll do a, uh, I'll grab this guy instead. So once I've targeted it, now I should be able to do something like staccato apps, which will list the apps for me. However, what's missing? I haven't authenticated yet. So, so it's good. They, they make you authenticate. And it's using the same credentials you, you used before. So in order to do that, you just staccato login. And I type in my username and password. How, how do you run this, the, the first, uh, the target command without authenticating? Oh, so target just shows you what you're pointing to. Okay. 
it's all done locally here. The, start, the target command isn't actually talking to the system. It's just, we're talking to the VM. It's just, okay, well, this instance is going to do that whenever it does anything. There's several commands, though, that are available for it that you must authenticate for. And this is an example. So now I can get a list of the applications that are actually running on this. And it's not very pretty, but I'm trying to make it a little bit more, yeah, that's a little better. So now you can see the apps that I've deployed on my instance by typing staccato space apps. Okay. And what I'm going to do, I, as it turns out I've already deployed this guy, so I'm going to get rid of it so we can go through the whole process. So I go staccato delete django dash gtd. And don't worry about that. that was, I was fiddling with the, the script earlier. And if now, if now I do the staccato apps command again, it'll show me that I now only have two apps running. The, and both of these we deployed earlier in this session. The env app showing the environment variables written in JavaScript and the uh, Jenkins uh, continuous integration server we deployed. Um, so those are running there now. So from now on, pretty much, I'm going to be using the command line to manage and query the VM, the uh, staccato, the PaaS instance. So here I am in the Django GTD app directory with all the stuff I need to do here. If I want to deploy this to the cloud, I just say staccato push, and I recommend adding the dash n option. And when you do this, there's an error in mine. It might, you might see it in yours too. Don't worry about it. Um, I'll fix it. Um, and if you watch this closely, you'll see things like the, uh, the framework and the runtime that are being used and the host name it's deploying it to. And it'll talk also about any dependencies that it's grabbing and things like that. Adding environment variables. Yes? Oh, no problem. Okay, yeah. Good. So after you've done the staccato target, do a staccato login. And then you'll enter those same credentials you did earlier. And so it's spewed all this stuff to the screen here. And showing me, I won't go into the, you don't have to worry about all the details, but what you do want to worry about or, or be aware of is that at the very end of this whole thing, it gives you a URL. And that's the URL for your application. And I now um, grab that URL, and then I should be able to hit it in a browser. And here it is. So there's the Django app running in the cloud with the single push. Do you know how the Django works and you make everything magical? I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'd be interested to, to find out. But. Uh -huh. And you just push and run. You do that with PHP or Flash application after the same thing? Is that, is that your question? Yes, that's true. PHP, Ruby on Rails, Sinatra, Java, Spring, Play, um, single. So the point is, with, with minimal configuration and tweaking, I took this Django app and I deployed it to the cloud. And it might, and it probably does, Let's have a look at staccato.yaml. Um, maybe I'm wrong here. Oh, yeah. It has services. So right here, you'll see it's specifying in the descriptor for this app. It says, well, it needs Postgres. It needs a database. And it needs, um, it's using memcached. So the app's using all that, but I didn't have to configure it. I didn't have to install Postgres. I didn't have to install memcached. It's just there and ready for me to go. So as you can probably imagine, it can be a pretty big time saver. So if you've installed Postgres 50 times, you could do it in your sleep. It doesn't really matter. But for a new development team, or, or if you haven't done it before, you know, it, it's a nice kind of launching point. You can move forward a lot farther without having to spend all the time fiddling with Postgres, for example. So we'll talk about a little bit more about some of these um, specifics. Um, but what I'd like to do now is uh, have you, I'll take a couple of minute break while I walk around the room, and I'd like you to, I suggest I'd like you to deploy a few of these applications um, yourself. So um, I've made a list of the ones that are known, they're known to work because I deployed them all yesterday morning. Um, these are the Python apps that are available on that link at the top, 
And I recommend you grab two or three of these and deploy them. Even better is grab one of your own apps and try to do the same. And I'll help you out if it comes across with any issues. Um, try to deploy it and see if it actually works for you. Not necessarily. So the question is, do I need a staccato.yaml to define the app? Um, it takes a bunch of defaults. So it tries to detect the framework and the language that it's using. So if it sees a um, wsgi.py, it says, oh, well, that's a WSGI app. So then it knows what to set up. If it sees a, um, a target directory with a foo.war file in it, it's, oh, that's a Java web app. If it sees a server.js, OK, that must be a Node.js app. So it, it tries to guess what the format or what the framework is using. However, what if you happen to have a .js file and a .py file and a .war file in the same directory? It's kind of you know, a crapshoot what it's going to choose. Um, so then you might want to use a, a file, to, uh, the staccato.yaml, to enforce that it is actually a Python app. But I would recommend, I'd really like to, someone here to try to grab just sort of not too compl complex of a Python app, and we'll try to get it deployed. But no matter what, please, I'll, I'll set the goal. If you can deploy two of these apps to your, the instance I've given you, um, it would be a really good start. Because we're going to be using these when we start talking about scaling these things and getting dozens of instances of these running. So I'll wonder.
I want to talk about scaling applications in the PaaS. Um, so there's facilities already here that allow you to do this very simply. And I'll show you on my instance. So I've got my uh, Django GTD app running in my local instance here. And it's running there. Um, no problem. So I go back to my console here. And I can see my Django GT app running in the console. And while I'm, just for in the interest of memory, I don't want to run out of memory while I'm doing this, I'm going to shut down my other two apps and I'm actually going to delete them immediately. So I can do this from the console as well as from the command line. I should be able to, yeah, delete and delete. So I'm just going to remove them entirely so I'm not going to risk running out of memory there. Now, in this Django GTD application here, I've got one instance running and you can see this by down here at the very bottom it lists every instance of the app that's running at the moment. Now, our, a common pattern for building web apps is you try to build them as stateless as possible so that multiple instances of applications can respond to your users without you having to deal with this instance is for that user, things like that. And what, if you build an app that way, it'll allow you to scale it out very simply. And um, this app is, I'm pretty sure, an example that would easily scale out meaning that multiple, any one of these app instances running could respond to any one of your users and it will work. Ideally, the state would be maintained in the URL that's used to access the app or other ways, in the session or whatever. There's many ways to do it. Um, so having said that, I've got a single instance of this app, but let's say I suddenly realize that I've, I'm gonna have thousands of users hitting this thing over time. That single instance, which is doing, I don't know, maybe some database operations and maybe some file system and a lot of calculations and memory stuff, um, it won't be able to handle these multiple instances or multiple requests to the application. So from the web console, I can, for this application, I can click this number of instances thing and I can say, well, really, I want four instances. And I just pop it up to four and hit save. And it accepts it. And, oh, I need to refresh this page. I'll just reload it here. And now I've got four app instances running. And now, you'll see they're all running on the same IP address. That's because I've only got one VM running here. But the point is that I now have four application instances running parallel. And ideally, um, if one of them is busy hitting the file system or running a bunch of heavy calculations, the second one will take the next request. And then when that gets bogged down, the third one gets the next request. So it brings me to the next point I need to address briefly so you can get an understanding of how this works. And then we're gonna start, then we're, the next thing we're gonna do, I can't believe how much time's left. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is build a cluster of these things and you can see the real power of this if I can, if I can pull it off. So let me um, grab the slide I was just looking for um, right here. Um, so this is the architecture of a Cloud Foundry-based platform as a service. And it, it's staccato here, but they're, they're very similar. Uh, I'll just run around the whole thing here. Um, so everything in this blue box is your staccato instance. And um, this could be dispersed across multiple VMs or it could be running in a single VM like everybody has got here. So at the top is a router. It's a software router that takes the traffic coming in from the outside, in other words, the users that are in their browsers, and it's directing that traffic to the applications or wherever they need to go, to the rest, uh, the cloud controller behind the rest interface or whatever. So that's the software router that deals with the incoming traffic. This part here, the cloud controller, is the manager of this whole PaaS itself. So it deals with everything. It's the one you say, I'd like to push my application, and here's the bits, and it takes the bits and, and pushes it out to the, the system, or it, it orchestrates all of that. Um, when you say staccato space apps to get a list of your applications, you're effectively making an HTTP call which hits this guy that then queries its internal data structures and says, oh, there's four apps running and here they are. So that, this is kind of the orchestrator of the whole thing. Built into this or, or related to this is the health manager, which is constantly watching each of the components of the system to make sure that they're healthy and taking action if it discovers that they are not. The action could be messages and log messages notifications, or it could be 
spawning up another application instance or whatever, things like that. So that's the health manager, this, um, which is all part of this whole controller thing. There's the stager, which is a component that's responsible for building the application in the instance. So it gets the bits for the app, it determines what uh, frameworks and runtimes are required, um, what other dependencies are involved, and it basically builds the application up. Uh, here is the, uh, just sort of a representation of the services that are bundled or, or included with the PaaS, so the database services, the file system services, uh, the message bus uh, services. Uh, so they're all deployed or provisioned as part of this, this PaaS, and they're, it's showing they're available there. And um, the next thing I'll mention is the applications themselves, the app instances themselves. So these kind of Rubik cube looking things, each one of those rectangular or squares that looks like this, represents a, inst a VM instance basically. Now in, in everybody's case here, we only have one of these guys. But inside of that VM instances, instance, you can have any number of applications running or you know, constrained by the resources of the system. And these applications run inside the LXE containers isolated from each other and um, protected from each other. So if one application spins out of control and is using infinite resources, it actually is only using what it's allotted and it won't affect the other applications running. And this application here can't inspect this application. They're, they're isolated and the LXE containers provide mechanisms that do that. And if you're interested, I'll be going into detail tomorrow. Um, but the point is when I, just now I went to my browser and I said I want four instances I clicked the button, so it made a REST call to this guy saying, well, I really wanted four instances, and it took care of not staging the app, but just pushing the app, or um, replicating the app instances inside the, the Staccato um, instance, basically, and making it available, making those applications available. The final thing I'll say is that now that I've got, let's say, four instances of my app running here, the router will just do a simple round robin load balancing basically to direct traffic to each one of those instances, round robin. So it goes to the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. First one, second, third, fourth. Very simple load ba balancing scheme. But that's kind of what's happening under the covers. Now there's, there's a lot of details we could get into is some of the advantages that this, provi this architecture provides as far as packing maximum amount of, of um, usage into the minimal amount of hardware and things. It's very powerful. And things with uh, security, making sure that the apps are isolated. Um, again, I'll be getting into that tomorrow. But I wanted to give you kind of an overview of what this looks like. Everything in a red box here can be pulled out and put into another VM. So if, if you have a very high demand application or high usage application, typically what you do is you create 10 VMs and you'd put the cloud controller on one of them, the stager on another one, one of the database services on another one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you could have MongoDB on this one and MySQL on this one. And then you would have a number of them um, allocated for the application instances themselves. And I really hope I can do this in the next <clears throat> 20 minutes because I think it's very illustrative and it's, it's pretty cool. So, um, What do I need, how, how do I need to start? Yeah, let's, let's just do it. So here I'm looking at my console here and I'd like to direct you to the cluster admin page which shows you the, the status of this cluster. So a cluster is a collection of staccato nodes, of PaaS nodes. And in this case, there's only one. And it is um, identified <coughs> uh, by, in this case, by its IP address. And here's the loopback address. It's just everything's local here. so. The, it, that's how it's identified. But if you look underneath, it's showing everything that's running on this particular node. A cluster contains multiple nodes, or one or more nodes. And uh, in this case, everything's on that. So the cloud controller, the DA, all the stuff I just talked about, the file system service, um, DNS, MySQL, the stager, the router, all that is just sitting on one VM. So what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes and running through the example of building multiple nodes uh, and building them into a single cluster. And I think, I think I'll be able to get away with this if everything cooperates. 
Um, so, I, I'd originally planned on having everybody either in the room or everybody on the cloud. Um, what I'd like to do is, let's just work with the cloud for now. And I'd like to request that everybody that has a cloud account, a cloud, um, you know, uh, 208.75.128. Whatever. Um, could you hit your console and hit users, the users tab, and click add new user? And let's just um, create um, PyCon at. It doesn't matter what the email address. Let's just call it PyCon at p.com or something. Oh, there's a good one. And let's use the password of Staccato, please, for everybody and make this user an administrator. So I'm asking this just for the people that are in the cloud. You're also welcome to do this on your own VM. It'll actually work if I identify the people that are running in the room that are not on the NAT, that are on the bridge network, we'll be able to actually create a cr cluster in this room as well, very easily if it, if it all works out. But uh, what I'm doing is, um, in, the, in the case of the cloud, um, creating a new user for it. So I do that, and now that user, pycon at p.com. So I have to remember that. Let's put it in my little notes here. pycon at p.com. OK. Now what I'm going to do is, has, uh, has anybody done that for me? Um, give me an IP address, the last three digits, last octet. 166? OK, so let's go there. So. Cool. So, and I've forgotten it already. PyCon at p.com. So it's very simple for multiple, as I said earlier, multiple users can access the same instance, no problem. It would actually have been pretty easy for me to, in this class just to have everybody on one instance, but I thought it would be more illustrative if we had multiple. Um, so now I go to cluster admin here. And you'll see very similar what you saw earlier. It's got a single node. And um, I'm actually going to hijack yours for a second. I hope that's OK, because uh, I kind of need to show everybody else. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do here, and for everybody that's on the cloud, um, and actually everybody even that isn't, that's fine. It'll work. If, you're, if your staccato, staccato command is, is working, type in staccato ssh api. Oh, sorry. What did I forget? Staccato, I forgot to target that box. So I need to target that one that I was just on there for a second. I go staccato target this guy. And then I do a staccato login, pycon at p.com, staccato. So now I'm authenticated to this guy. And there's no apps on here right now. Is that right? Ah. Oh, under the new user. Thank you. Very good. So I created a new user. That's cool. So the users are isolated from each other. So I can't see your apps and you can't see mine. Very nice. Um, there's a command called Kato, which I haven't talked about yet. But the Kato command is used to manage the nodes internally. So it's an internal command that does stuff. Uh, lots of things it'll do. But in this case, what it'll do is allow us to create a cluster. And what I would do in order to do this, what I want to do is I want to have this core node to be just the cloud controller, let's say, and a couple more things that are necessary. So if I want to do that, I just simply type in Kato node setup core. Wait a minute. Did you give me admin access? Hmm. I believe you, but I'm going to check anyway. <laughs> yeah. Really? Oh, whoa. What is that? I don't understand that host name. Um, that must be the reverse DNS from the internet provider, from Comcast or something. Oh, I'm on the Python OK. Uh, shouldn't, because I'm going 
directly to that host that is sitting somewhere else. Um, so somebody's, re somebody's doing something weird here. I must have done something wrong. Let me try it again. Hmm. Looks right. Well, maybe I forgot to log in. Maybe I forgot to SSH. API. Oh, did I forget to target? I'm sorry. It's a Let's start over again. Let's do everything from scratch. Staccato target is showing me that guy. Staccato login, just to make sure I'm authenticated. I already did this, right? Icon at p.com. Yeah, so it knows I logged in, so it's not asking for the password. Fair enough. Now I do a staccato SSH to this box, and now I'm nervous. And I type in the password. And I type it again because I mistyped it. Oh, wow. oh, okay, so that's interesting. I think I see what's happening here. I would need to get in as, I believe is, well, is your user? Yeah, when, when Staccato is first created, it'll use your password instead of mine. So tell you what, I'll just use mine here. That'll be just, Edward. oh, Edward, okay. Oh, there I'm in. Good. It's a little sluggish. That's probably our, I suspect it's our network here because that, that system back there is just loaded with resources. All right. Kato is here. All right, let's, let, I'll go back to where I was, what I was trying to do earlier, which was, um, the following. Kato node setup core and then what I, what I provide this command is the external known name to this guy, which looks something like this. So I go Kato node setup core, and I type in that name. And what it should do, yes, is it'll reconfigure this particular node to be kind of the master node for this entire cluster. So what I'm gonna eventually do in the next 10 minutes, hopefully, and anybody can follow along on this, um, but actually, I don't recommend you do this yet. Um, what you'll be doing is doing this command, and this will set this one up, yours, as the core. And then what we'll do is get the other ones to join in as, as you know, um, individual roles, like the stager or the, one of the app, the DEAs, the, the applet container, the app container. And um, I'm a little puzzled why this is so, this now shouldn't be our network being slow. Are you running some heavy duty uh, <laughs> Hadoop kind of uh, thing on there or something? No. That's okay. I, I don't. Are you running? I doubt you're, you're hitting any resources. But that's okay. Um, parallel to this, I'm going to do the same on mine just to see who, who wins. So staccato target. And I'll grab my local one if I can find it. That's it right there. Right, I think it's mine. Oh, I don't need to log in. Probably. And so when you change targets, it should remember the the credentials and stuff. So I'm just going to do the same command here. Um, SSH API. And hopefully my password. This one's responding a little faster. If I do the same thing, Kato nodes setup core, um, and then I need my that same. Um, uh, IP address, which, why is it not, lost well, my pasteboard. Okay. Hmm. It's going a little faster, maybe. Maybe not. So I'll let that, I'll let that plug away. And then the next thing I'm going to do, so I'm, I've set this guy up as, a, as the core node, or at least that's in the process of happening. So the next thing I want to do is go get another VM. I'm sorry, I'm going to hijack somebody else. Is there someone else that would be willing to give me their, their uh, external host as well as the password? <laughs> so if you use one of your own passwords, don't, don't give it to me. And no problem if not. 
I wonder, did I give out 182 yet? Yeah. I did. Yourself. What's that? Yourself. Oh, did I? No, I'm using oh, okay, all right. Um, Q8 dot. Just see how the. Okay, now part of this first one, it's asking for my um, password, and this is, which one is this? That's the one, that's yours, right? Okay, good. Excellent. With any luck, now I go back to that system and hit cluster admin, crossing all my fingers and toes and everything. Login. Oh, that's, yeah, I could understand that. All right. Um, I'll just use that, my user now instead of yours, pycon at p.com. Um, I'm, I am puzzled. So normally when I do this, it's just, so is it the PyCon net or the Santa Clara net or is it something on that system? I don't, I actually don't know. But on the other hand, mine is finished too. So let me go there on mine. And if I go to cluster admin, yeah, good. All right, so now you'll see a couple of differences. First of all, there's an error on the top. This cluster is missing some very crucial components. The cluster is totally useless without a stager. Because what are you going to do? You can't stage apps. You can't push apps. And also it's missing the DEA. I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned that. The DEA stands for Droplet Execution Agent. It's just a term that was coined by Cloud Foundry, I believe. And um, it's the VM that runs these multiple app instances. Okay, so, But we don't have one. All we have is a node that's running controller and router, and that's it. So it's, it's kind of minimally configured. So now we need to add some of these capabilities to it. So since I'm on this one, um, which is this guy, I can do a Kato, Kato role add stager, for example. Stager. And it'll say, okay, this guy's going to be a stager for me as well. And it's done. So now if I reload this page, with any luck, it shows me stager here, but it's still saying it's missing DEAs, okay? Uh, the droplet, the app containers. Uh, I'll go again to this one here and have a look, and it's probably, it should be, if it's working, it should be exactly the same. Yep. So this is your instance running externally. The IP address it's showing is the internal address of this instance. So it's sitting in this, you know, outside on the net somewhere, well, behind a LAN, the LAN address is here, the external address is that 208.75 one we gave it. Okay, you had just given me one. Um, API.28.75.128.177. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, login. And username? Uh, oh, unless you, unless you created one. Did you create one? Yeah. Oh, I'll just use that. I'll use pycon at p.com, I think. And, oh, it, that might not work, though. Because then it's going to ask for that other password, which is the one you just told me, which is pycon. It's, hmm. What did I do wrong? P Y C O N, right? No. Maybe it's that same ish issue. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get there. We're, we're really close. Um, let me think. I don't. You gave me 177. I knew this was too ambitious. All right, so let's try this. 28751 one to 8177. So, it's letting me in. If 
If I have admin rights, what I'm just going to do, I'm just going to just double check and, um, oh, okay. Can I just change your password? Yeah, well, I tried that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I tried that there. Okay, don't, don't change the password underneath it because it will, it will, um, get confused. No, that'll confuse it. That maybe is what happened. Yeah. So um, Staccato manages a lot of things for you. Um, and if, if you change it underneath, then things will probably get out of sync. Um, OK, let me, let me try something else here. This will possibly work. Are you able to SSH in? Yeah, I just generated a random password just like read off read off but I can if you want. Oh okay, well try it out if it's unless it's really long. You know, it's oh go, yeah. Did you say V or B? V Oh backspace works. Is that it? Yeah. I'm in. Cool. Amazing. Am I in? Yes, I am. Good. All right. Ah, phew. So I apologize for the kind of fumbling here. So 177, if I go to cluster admin now, it should be just telling me it's a normal staccato node on the loop at, on 127.0.1 with all the roles enabled. Okay, great. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go Cato. Um, they've changed the, the syntax of this just recently. Um, Cato. I'm just going to do it this way. Attach. Minus E, D, E, A. So I'm going to say that I want this guy to be an app execution um, VM as opposed to a stager or anything else. And now all I need to give, it, give to it is the IP address of the core node, 208.75.128.177. And it says it's deprecated because you're supposed to say node attach, but that's fine. And it's saying stopped. Um, what I'm going to do while I'm here too, and we're almost done, is, um, whoops, host name is, this is the 66 one. I'm going to go Cato node enable um, DEA on here. So this is the, the core node I had set up. Let me go back there in the console. Um, this guy here. Is that right? Keep track of all these addresses. I thought I enabled the stager on there, but that's okay. Oh, that was on my heart. <sighs> if I enable the DA on here, if I type in the command, um, roll, enable DA, I think that's it. Roll add, okay. They changed the syntax like two weeks ago. And with any luck, that'll start the DA on this guy. <coughs> Missing the stager, maybe I'll add the stager here too. Cato roll add stager. This will all come out in the wash in a second, I promise. <laughs> okay, let's reload this page. Here's a node that's kind of minimally configured. It has the controller, the router, the DA, and the stager. And then that's 66, that's yours. And then I go to 77 and look at this. And it says it's unavailable, so why is that? Uh, not that one. Oh, because it's still in the midst of its reconfiguration. That explains it. So, but that's fine. Um, give me a time just to talk about it briefly for a sec. Just to explain what I'm kind of fumbling through right now. I've never done this live before, okay. Um, is what I'm trying to do is create a cluster, multiple VMs that each one takes on some of these roles. So. Um, what, at the end result of what's going to happen now is that there'll be one node, your node, the core node, which contains the cloud controller, the health manager, the router, and also a stager, and one DEA, or a, a DEA, not one, but it's just enabled as a DEA, so it means it can run, run applications. And then I, I used yours and set it up, so all it is doing is running one of these guys and nothing else, except for some fundamental things that is needed to make it work. 
and it's taking its time. I'm going to have to go look on that system. I'm now suspicious that there's something going on out there that uh, I don't have control over. Um, but it is kind of odd, though. So, um, having said that, um, maybe I'll just buzz back to my other presentation while I'm here because it's worth hitting a couple of these things before, before we leave. I'd like you just to know that this exists. Logging is, it's an interesting topic. So back in like 20 years ago, logging was, or 25, I don't know, logging was fun, right? Single application, single log file, and then you get to play around with it with like awk and grep and Perl and all that. Um, Python, I guess. Um, and then it got complicated with client server. So uh, you have multiple things running all over the network and you have to try to correlate all these logs from all these different sources. And it's just a pain in the butt. And there's so many, I mean, things, just simple things like if the timestamp or the time, the clock is wrong on the client compared with the server, you just don't have a clue. How do you correlate those, right? There's, it's just complex. And then if you introduce the cloud where you have apps running across data centers, across continents, um, you can imagine that logging can be a real pain. And in fact, it could be, but all of that just magically goes away with a pass. It just deals with all of it for us in a very simple way. And um, what you would, oh good, this is finished. But I'll, I'll just finish my thought here because it's, it's worth mentioning. There's a number of uh, log aggregating services available. It's called Logging as a Service, L-A-A-S, for example. Logly is one and there's several other ones. There's also <coughs> applications you can deploy in your uh, on-premise, basically, and behind your firewall, like Splunk or Graylog2 and a few others. It allows you to collect the logs from any source and then deal with them, run analytics or create graphs and charts. So Logly is a good example of these and, and Logify. Um, and with Staccato or with a, another PaaS, what you can do is you say, well, I want to take the logs from this application and direct them over to Logly. And I do that with a single command. I go Staccato, drain, app name, log name, and then I say Logly and a port number. And all the logs for that app go to Logly now, this log, logging aggregation service somewhere out on the cloud with a single command. And what's even more interesting is if I've got 50 instances of my app, they will all get routed to Logly with that single command. I don't have to do anything. I've done this multiple times before PaaS, and it's just a pain in the butt, you know, starting an agent sitting on your server that has to collect the logs however it does and send it off, and maybe that agent crashes. It just it gets really ugly. And, uh, you know, it could take you hours, it could, well, okay, it takes me hours often just to configure this stuff. And it's just so nice to be able to just type in a single command and have it taken care of. So it's kind of an important feature which I wanted to bring it to your attention. That doesn't look like a good message. No, I don't know what's happening. That's too bad. I'm going to try something radical. I don't even know if this will work. I'm not sure of the network topology, but I'm going to just try to do a, let's see, from my local instance here, Cato, Hatch, minus E, D, A, and I'm going to try to hit this guy. I don't know if it's even going to work, but Logly, okay. So just to bring, bring that to light, um, this is the Logly site. It's just a, uh, this is a, an example of kind of a software as a service. It's sitting on the wet, on a, in the cloud somewhere. And it's really cool because you can then generate graphs and charts and analytics and tables and all sorts of stuff of your application's behavior or its events going on in there. So extremely powerful tool, but to try to imagine building this yourself, you know, take a whole team like six months to build it. Or you could purchase um, Splunk, which is a very powerful app too, um, or Logly or anything like that, and it does it all for you. So uh, it's, it's a pretty powerful kind of tool. Now I see that uh, I'm out of time. Wow, I can't believe it. Um, so I think the last thing I'm going to do is just let this finish. And while it's doing, I might as well just pause. Um, if there's any questions or any comments or anything, it'd be, um, it'd be a good time to address them now.
is there a step that you can deploy from that to some cloud service? Okay, yes. So the question is, I've deployed it all on the VM on my laptop, and now I want to take all of that stuff and just push it to the cloud somewhere. And you w there is no way, there's not a way to take a snapshot, for example. I, I mean, I assume there is underneath, you know, but I wouldn't do it that way. Um, what you would do is just push your apps again. So, but it's all just a single command, right, to push. So, so you could script, if you've got 10 apps, you just push them in the script. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's the typical, kind of the typical use case for this thing. So, and I have the same problem here. Um, I don't know what's going on. It's, it's very likely operator error. Um, I'm, I'm much better doing this kind of stuff if I'm just sitting in a cube and focused. <laughs> but that's my excuse for today. Um, so anyway, um, what would happen, <laughs> what you would be seeing, is you would see on this page, you would see multiple nodes listed, up as many as you want. I've seen hundreds. Extremely powerful when you think um, you could have not, not hundreds of your apps in running instances, but you could have th literally thousands. You could have you know, 15 running in each particular VM of your particular app. And um, so the scalability is, is just instant and out of the box and rap, you know, just right away you can scale your app rapidly. So what is it that really blew your mind that, that one time you Yes. Right Thanks now? for asking that. So the quite, I said earlier when I started that I sat down and, and, and deployed this thing. And, um, and the question was like, what really blew my mind? Because it really did. And it was effectively realizing the amount of hours and agony and pain that I've gone through in the last five years building logs or configuring this and that and everything out, MySQL and Mongo, you know, it just it goes. And, and to have that just evaporate to me. And so, an anecdote again, I worked for a company, I won't mention their name, an enterprise software company in the utility industry um, building the kind of thing, if you, if you log into your utility site, you see graphs of your usage, stuff like that. So we did a lot of that stuff. And we had teams of people devoted, like a database team that has, is responsible for Oracle. And there's four people on that team, and they're experts. In, and you say, well, I need a database instance for my QA, whatever. Two weeks later, we still didn't have the darn thing, right? And, and with something like this, it's a click of a button. So two weeks, click a button, right? And the problem, or not the problem, the, the thing that just continually blows my mind, it, it still does, is how this just happens with everything with paths. Um, logging is an example. Debugging is an example. Try imagine debugging a cloud app. Here it's just a click of a button or a type of a command. And there's examples after examples. So I envision companies that are 40 people big, not companies, engineering teams and QA and deployment teams, 40 big, that could be reduced. This isn't good for the programmers, but reduced to like five people, right? Um, and to me, it's just, it's, it's, right poise to revolutionize how we build software. And I'm convinced it will. And my kind of my calling right now in this stage of my life is just try to share that. And I haven't been fully successful even here. I wish, I wish this had worked and I wish I could have brought a couple more things. But I, yeah, anyway, that's my story. <laughs> so I've got a couple of questions. Well, one really. Um, do, do people here see this might be useful in your, in your professional life or even personal life, do you think? How many people could envision you might be using something, or you'd like to use something like this? Just curious. Yeah, good. Um, I encourage you to play around with Staccato as much as you want. Um, I've got a, I, I should probably keep a couple of these for tomorrow, but if, if you're desperate for a USB stick, I could give, it, give you one with it on. And, um, and I'd be uh, fully open if you want to contact me. Um, I think I put my email somewhere here. If you got questions or comments about the course. And then the final thing I'm supposed to say, oh, which would be really cool too if you could do it, is there's a survey. Oh, now where is it? Can you publish it on your tutorial page? Yes, and it's, it's kind of the standard PyCon thing. Do you guys know the survey? Should be in what? 
I think it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's nothing to do with me. It's a PyCon survey. And let me just see if I can find it on here. Oh, here it is. I got it. If you, if, I would really appreciate it if, if people could hit this site. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, a short version as well, if you'd rather. The more, the more feedback, it'd be helpful for me for sure, um, just what worked for you and what didn't work, and feel free to gripe about the cluster fa failing that I was unable to do. Um, the other URL is this one if you want, just goo.gl slash capital P lowercase v capital H capital D lowercase c. So if you don't mind, I'd highly appreciate it. And I'll hang out here if you want to... Um, if you want me to help you get your VM working, I, I'll stay here as long as it takes. So, And with that, I'll say thanks for your time. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a great class. So thanks. Thank